I wanted really to talk about practicalities. So I'm not going to do some high fluted rhetorical, you know, we need a revolution sort of situation. I'm going to try and focus on what we're here on this call to do, which is to bring about revolutionary change in our countries. And that's essentially, of course, a matter of action. And I want to make it clear in so much as I'm going to be doing these calls over the you know, coming year, that that's the project, right? We're not getting together on these calls to do high theory and pat each other on the backs that we've got the right idea. That's absolutely not what we need to do. Partially, of course, because it's not going to get us anywhere and partially because it's completely irresponsible given the gravity of the situation we face and the opportunities we face, uh, as I'll come on to speak about. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of praxis, but praxis for me is the central concept that we need to, gr to grasp when we start thinking about how we go about uh, our actions in the coming weeks, months and years. And what praxis means for those that you're unfamiliar about it, with it is the notion of combining or fusing theory and action into one, one whole, as you might say. So it's really important that we understand that we build theory out of action. That means when you go and knock on doors and you work out that if you say X, Y, and Z, the person is more interested, then you build a theory based upon action. So we're not here to read books and then push that theory into action. What we're here to do is to create action and make concepts and patterns out of it uh, to help us become more effective. That said, theory is important in the sense that the theory has to inform pra uh, practice as well. Theory has to inform action. As soon as you engage in an action, by definition, you've got a theory about what to do. And sometimes theory is really important in the sense that when myself and um, Robin helped set up Extinction Rebellion, we had a theory that if 10,000 people went to London, for two weeks, then we would create political change. We hadn't got a practice on that. We'd just, we'd just worked it out from the theory of how you create change uh, in the fastest way possible. And the other thing that I want to mention before sort of getting going on things is this notion of imagination. So those of you that are familiar with David Graeber know that his opinion and my opinion as well, and is that imagination is the most revolutionary act that we're never going to get anywhere if we remain or fall into cynicism. What we actually need is naivety in the sense that we're prepared to do things, whether they're going to actually work or not. And this connects really with the big theme I'm hoping to explore in coming months is, is a revolutionary basically enjoys their life. Right? They're not constantly agonizing about what to do and how to be effective. They've already decided they're going for the revolution. They love their fate, if you know that phrase. They're doing it and that's their life. They're living their life. And it's a life that a revolutionary lives. It's a revolutionary life, in other words. It's not a transactional, I'll be an activist for a year or two. And really that's what I'm trying to encourage, particularly the younger generation to think about and connect the younger generation with that long, 200 year tradition of revolutionaries who have made the modern world through just going for it, as you might say. So obviously, like there's a uniqueness to the present moment and everyone here is, is more than aware that the threat we face is unique. It's beyond terrible. It's universal. It affects the whole world. It's going to go on effectively forever. And if something dramatic doesn't happen, it's going to be terminal as far as the human race is concerned. And at the same time, we have massive potential to engage in collective action. We have a tradition of creating social rights. We have education, we've got technology. We can do something, and that's what we're here to actually design and support each other on. And in so much as this situation is gonna create social stress and social breakdown, the big theme, as I've spoken about before, is not climate, it's fascism. 
climate is simply the tool through which the global working class, the global ruling class rather, is enacting mass murder upon the people of the world. And the response to that, if there isn't a social pro-social pro alternative, is people will fall into fascistic ways of responding because there's nothing else on offer. And we've seen this in you know, the Netherlands, in Italy, obviously with Trump in America. So the design of what we're doing here is to create a pro-social revolution as an alternative pathway to fascism, given that the neoliberal system is inevitably going to collapse over the next five to 10 years. That's the main scenario, okay? Obviously, when I say it's the main scenario, I'm not saying it's the only scenario, but we need to be realistic and honest with ourselves about what we face and the most likely thing that is going to happen. And I was in a, a GSO strategy meeting, a Just Up Oil strategy uh, session this week, and one of the people describing new strategy was saying, look, we're fucked. Everything's really bad and things are going to get worse. <clears throat> and I want to respectfully, like, like um, challenge that, that it's not that we're fucked, it's that the system is fucked. That's a very different proposition. In other words, the present political system is going to collapse. It has, it's totally fucked up as we know. And that leaves open the potential for a massive social renewal. And this is the positive message I'm trying to get across. And I'm not trying to bullshit people here by going, oh, we've got to give people hope. I'm absolutely serious on the basis of the history of revolutionary episodes over the last 300 years. When elite, an elite commits suicide, as this elite is doing, it opens up this massive potential for new social movements to bring about fundamental change. And that's exciting. So it's not us that are fucked. We haven't made the mistake. It's the elites. So I'm going to talk about a plan. I'm not going to talk in great detail about what, you know, what's going wrong and what we need to do. I want to talk about how we actually get going. Um, and I think there's three elements. The first element is here and now, right? This is something that's endlessly like avoided by, you know, academics and people that just write, like to read the books and what have you, is the biggest question really is what you're going to do next Wednesday. That's where you start. You always start at the here and now. All the big movements that I've helped to create, you know, the, some of the biggest campaigns in the Western world and the climate, all start in a meeting like this where we go, OK, what are you going to do next week? And then what are you going to do the week after? For instance, at the moment, I'm advising on a campaign to create a candidate to put up against Keir Starmer in his Camden constituency. What I'm doing, I'm not focusing on, you know, why Keir Starmer's a bad person. I'm not focusing on the grand glory of going up against him. What I'm thinking about is who's going to be in the meetings next week and what's, what is the agenda going to be? In other words, I'm thinking about this crucial next two to three weeks which is going to basically determine whether we have a structure and a culture that can basically run a campaign. The second thing is collectivity, which is, which is to understand that we need to make decisions together. I don't want everyone from this call to go home, you know, sit in your bed, sit, or whatever it is, and think, hey, what am I going to do to change the world? You're just not going to come up with something creative. You're just going to get depressed. You need to make decisions together on this call and with groups within your own country. And that's the way that you create collective consciousness. And collectivity is the key determinant, of course, of success when you're dealing with going up against the powers that be. And the last thing, and this is obviously the theme of these talks, really, is leadership. Leadership is agonizingly difficult because, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to appear like you're some sort of dick you know <laughs> who's saying hey i'm great follow me and all that crap right and at the same time it's inevitable that every movement needs leaders and you notice i'm using the plural there right i'm not on this call to say hey guys follow me what i'm on this call to say is you need to step up so that you effectively can take my place over the next months and years 
So I'm putting myself out there. No doubt I'll be criticised for it and, you know, for better or worse. But what I'm saying is that you need to lead this collectivity. You need to go to your country and go stand up in your meetings and go, here's a plan for the next three weeks to get us into some sort of shape so that we can actually expand and get on with it. So I'd like to just tell a little story that always embarrasses Robin. But anyway, but myself and Robin helped to start Extinction Rebellion. And um, and Robin had the, what was it, Robin? You had the west side of the country and I had the right side of the country. So this massive movement that started, you know, 70 countries uh, starting Extinction Rebellion and 200,000 people joining in the UK, it all started with three or four meetings when me and Robin were scratching our heads going, OK, how do we mobilise the UK? Well, we st what we decided is next Wednesday, I was going to go to Nottingham. Robin was going to go to Bristol. And, we and it was step by step. So I'm not I'm totally serious about this. That's how we need to get going. And there's always a chicken and egg problem. If you've ever set up a project or if you're in a project at the moment, there's always this chicken and egg, which is, oh, you know, I can't I can't do this because we need to do that. And we can't do that because we haven't done this. <clears throat> there's an easy solution to this. You know, as a professional who sets up movements and campaigns, it doesn't worry. Chicken and egg problems don't worry me at all. The solution to chicken and egg problems is small steps. You do a little bit of this, so you can do a little bit of that, and then you can do a little bit more of something else, and then you can do more of other things. You don't think in big steps. You don't go, oh, I want to set up a campaign in Spain. You go, okay, I'm going to get eight of my friends onto a Zoom call in Madrid, and I'm going to work on the agenda. And then we're going to go out and do something, and then we're going to have an another meeting, and da 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 you know with within are you can you hear me sorry we just lost you for a sec roger oh okay i'll say that again <laughs> that's the critical bit <laughs> um yeah. let me just check i i'm on the right yeah i am okay so those people i've worked with and you know no doubt there's some of these people on the call in the a22 network with some of the campaigns that have become the biggest campaigns in their country on the climate we, what we know is the first eight weeks is crucial uh, because that that gets the momentum going. And it's all about doing these small steps and going, OK, what do we need to do next? What do we need to do next? So I'm going to get practical on you all, dare I say it, and I'm going to su suggest that this revolution in the 21st, revolution in the 21st century situation, these calls, we want to make this into a bit of a thing. And I was very pleased when Robin said he was going to support me on getting going because I can't get going at all on making this a big thing without Robin's help and Robin's give and a whole bunch of ideas around it. So that leads us on to thinking about where we want to do go with these calls and the books and the videos. So what we want to do is to create positions, as it were, for free, part-time or full-time people. And they're going to help get videos out about me, you know, do the books, get me on interviews and in the papers. I've been on the biggest liberal paper in, in the Netherlands. I've been in the Times recently. There's four or five big national newspapers want to interview me. So in other words, like <clears throat> the first step is to use the asset you have. Asset in inverted commas, which is my profile internationally. But the point here is not the interview, right? The interview is what's called a node. It's the pathway between the nodes. It's the connection between the nodes, which is important. This is really important to understand, right? It's not doing the interview, you know, with CNN, which is important. It's saying on the interview that there will be a national Zoom in the US for people that are interested. In other words, it's the bridges between the nodes, if you want to use network theory words. In other words, it's these pathways to the next step which are important. And this is a massive, massive problem. 
a friend told me yeah this week who works with cornell west don't know if you know cornwell cornell west but he's a great guy and he's standing for president of the united states no less and he went to a big bid did a big demonstration in about palestine what have you in washington a few weeks ago but you know no doubt he said great things but critically he didn't provide any pathways to action didn't even say as far as i'm aware that he was standing for president and here's the link to the national zoom call to get involved so hopefully you understand what i mean you know you want to print this in your foreheads is it's not the activity it's the activity that leads to the next activity and provides that pathway so for instance you know the pathways we have at the moment is to get involved in revolution in 21st century create pathways to collective action in your countries which is potentially humanity project on assemblies a22 on direct action potentially it's going to be others and obviously to give money because it's money and people that's going to drive the process okay so that's what i call like the step the 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 sort of takeoff stage to get your initial ducks in the row but what myself and robin have been talking about is is making this revolution in the 21st century a international thing is get it to grow so it becomes a global brand and the whole point of promoting me dare i say is not because i'm on some big ego trip i find it quite embarrassing to be honest with you but i'm doing it out of service so that i can create a profile for revolution in the 21st century so that i can then help other people to come on and take uh positions of publicity as it were to replace me or to work by my side and ultimately so i'm not the only guy in the space there's you know five or six people or even i'm not there anymore because the other people are so good what this concretely means is is going back to the cnn interview i cnn go oh we want to in in you know interview you roger and i go yeah well you're going to have to interview me with jerry or something you know and jerry comes on with me and he's 24 and jerry gets to speak for his generation i'm not speaking for the younger generation but i use my power to bring on jerry so that he can then become a get a profile in his own right obviously there's variations on, on the theme but that's the direction of travel as you might say and then there's a bunch of other things in this growth period that we we're looking at doing so the first thing is to respond to global events um so for instance in the uk the british judiciary is about to say that climate activists have no defense in court so i put something on twitter and at the end of my twitter communication i said well come to a zoom and i'm going to speak about that and at the zoom there'll be a pathway for people to join you know just a or or last generation or whatever so responding to the immediacy of global events is something we're really useless at as an international movement in the sense of actually bringing together thousands of people who are totally mad about what's going on in the moment. And what we know, of course, from psychology is it's in the moment that people get energized and join movements. The second thing that really gets up my nose no disrespect to Greenpeace, is why is it that whenever there's an international story, it's Greenpeace, which has been going, you know, for 50 years, that gets all the quotes. Why don't we have a media team internationally that phones up the Guardian, you know, phones up the New York Times and says, actually, the people creating change in this world are age 22, your humanity. Why don't you have on Jerry, who was with Roger on CNN, and he's going to give you a quote. And of course, when Jerry comes on, he'll be saying, Actually, we're totally fucked, or rather the system's fucked, and we need a revolution. In other words, we get the, the paradigm of revolutionary change into the public sphere as a serious proposition, rather than have, you know, we need policy change and all the rest of it that you're going to get from the NGOs. The third thing is, is educational and inspirational events. Like once we've got organized and we're in this growth phase, then we can ask on the leading world intellectuals and public figures to come on calls and these can be co-hosted you know with other organizations in a22 and what have you but it's at that point dare i say i can email noam chomsky and you know all, all those guys and say come on we have several thousand people on a call 
And then all those people have a pathway into, into the pathways we've talked about. Then we're producing books, we're producing reports, stuff on the science, stuff on revolutionary change. And last but not least, we're doing big fundraising. So once we've got into a position where we can promote this brand, we can go to all these rich people who are shitting themselves about the end of democracy and the coming of fascism and say, we're the main show in the Western world. We're the people that network with the people who are going to organize the people to get on the street, right? This is high leverage stuff. So there's a plan, for instance, to go and talk to some of these guys and get $5 million. And that can be distributed across the Western world or across the world globally to actually seed and fund these movements that are going to provide an alternative to fascism. And this is, you know, don't get me wrong, this is not going to happen tomorrow, but this is the direction of travel. And what I'm hoping to persuade you is thinking about things on the international scale is totally smart at this point in history. It's not going, oh, I know, I'm just doing stuff in Holland. You know, I'm just doing stuff in Italy. You need to attend to the international media sphere and getting this international frame on the go, which will then lead to us raising lots of money, which will then lead to more mobilization in, in actual, on, on a national scale. You see what I mean? It's about creating this growth ecology, which brings me on to stage three. Stage three is what, what I'm calling an ecology of revolution. Notice I'm saying it's an ecology of revolution, not an ecology of resistance. Resistance is the idea that the status quo is in control and you're in resistance to it. That's the old frame. The new frame is the system is already going to collapse and we need a revolution to replace the system, right? We're not resisting the system. We need to replace the system because we, if we don't, then we're going to hell. So that's what I call the mature design, that the revolutionary paradigm is a respectable mainstream proposition, like it was at the time of the English Revolution, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, right? People in the past you know, centuries talked about revolution in the same way as people think about voting for the Christian Democrats. It's something that's in there that people talk about, and it's our role to make it a talking point around, around, um, around the world. So this is what, as I said, is the mature design. There's an ecology. What an ecology means is not a strict hierarchy, but it means a functional hierarchy between different elements of a system. So there's the frontline movements, right? The direct action movements, the assembly movements, people doing big cultural educational events, people standing in elections, you know, not to participate in parliaments, but to build up uh, uh, an ecology of, of um, uh, confrontation, as it were, with the existing regime. So those of you that have been listening to my episode, you should be familiar with that four point program, street movements, assemblies, cultural events, standing in elections. All these come together. Those are the frontline movements. That's not what we're going to do in revolution in the 21st century. What we're doing is to create a vanguard behind these vanguards. In other words, a way of bringing on the leaders of the next you know, 20 years, providing templates for how these, these uh, frontline movements can work properly and to enable the revolutionary elites, as it were, the people, the revolutionary activists, to come together and support each other and have some identity. So I've already mentioned, you know, the whole idea is to create leaders, raise money, education, inspiration. But two more sort of more speculative ideas, and you might think this is a bit funny, is to create revolution clubs with members and rituals, right? So, you know, you go to Madrid and you can look at the revolution club. And I'm really inspired by, you know, what they did in the late 18th century and early 19th century, where people were coming together at and the key question they were asking is, what's next, right? What are we doing next? Because this system's going to collapse. And they're bringing people in, having, you know, banquets and all this sort of stuff. And then the other idea is planning the next civilization, which I spoke about at Christmas, which is we need concrete proposals and designs on everything that's practical so that when things start to crack, we can say, this is what we're going to do with the water supply. This is what we're going to do with transport. This is what we're going to do with farming. 
these are the things that we want to present to citizens assemblies that are going to have legally binding powers. So we're already providing this inspiration and this, this way of actually creating this new civilization when you know all these ruptures start happening. Okay, so that's the plan. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um uh what we want to do, I'm gonna I'm going to uh have a look at your oh you're all on you're all on have we have we taken everyone's camera off or is everyone trying to be secretive? Don't know. Anyway, what we're going to do is ask you something, which is we want to raise uh £2,000 tonight, okay? £2,000 a month. So we want everyone on this call to give this project £20 a month. So the proviso, of course, is if in three months it's all rubbish and me and Robin have fallen out and, you know, the whole thing's collapsed, feel free to cancel cancel your commitment. But Robin's going to put in the chat the link for everyone to give their £20 a month. Now, obviously, some people on the call, you know, can't give that much, but everyone can do £5, $5, €5, Euros, right? So this is an act of collectivity. And it's basically to enable us to take this to the next stage. And what I'm appealing to you all is not, hey, you know, Roger wants me to give him some money. I'm appealing for you to be strategic and understand that we need to create infrastructure on an international level. And that's worth a fiver, right? It's worth $20. And as I say, after three months, if it's not going well, then, you know, you can give that money to Greenpeace or whatever, right? <laughs> Maybe not. So what we're doing, this is right, Robin, what we're going to do is a little experiment is we're going to put this link in the chat. You can all go and, you know, go and get yourself a cup of tea. You click on the link and you give that money. And obviously, if you can give your $100, your $200, and I know some of you can, then obviously give that. And then we'll let everyone know how much you've raised. Brilliant. Whilst you're filling that out, I can also tell a little bit of a story to add on to what Roger was saying before we get into the questions. Um, because I think it's inspirational, this way Roger describes it, of really bit by bit breaking down, you know, not getting lost in despair, but finding this constant path to action. And so this was us in the beginning of Extinction Rebellion, right? We started with a very small number of talks and meetings uh, across the UK and I, I would go to places like York and there would be two people there right and that you just deal with that as the spirit of a revolutionary you're not going there thinking oh there's only two people there you're going there thinking I'm doing the right thing I'm doing my my job here which is to raise the the word and so sometimes you get two people but sometimes you go to Newcastle you go to some radical cinema like I did and you get 50 people and then they're in tears and they're hugging you at the end. And it's this huge emotional community lift that then starts to bring people together into affinity groups that were then the people who took action with us in these rebellions. So you have to roll the dice. And I think one of the things we're saying about this project is you've got to enjoy doing that. You've got to enjoy the experiment, enjoy playing with what could be and what might happen. And there are these moments that will just explode if you keep doing that. These moments of immense joy and uplift, like the rebellions of thousands of people that will come out onto the street. And these things happen in our complex system. They often happen by a kind of chance, right? So one of the things that brought a thousand people onto the street for the first Extinction Rebellion, our declaration, was the fact that George Monbiot wrote about uh, fracking the week beforehand and thank god he put a link to our facebook event at the end of the article he didn't just you know say it's time to call to action he put a concrete pathway to action like roger's talking about at the end of the article right then who shared that bernie sanders in the u.s massive global figure shares it suddenly went from 50 people expected to turn up to a thousand these are how social change moments happen. Really, they can be exponential in these ways. And it requires that pathway to action always to be available. 
to help make that happen. So these small steps, these small actions that might feel like, oh, no one came along to my local Zoom meeting can turn into whirlwind events. You just have to keep fighting on for them. There's a kind of sublime madness, I think Chris Hedges says, in being a revolutionary, which is that you just keep going for what you believe in. And I think a really important point around how we built the movement from that through these concrete actions is then to have a way of big organizing. So I can recommend a book. We can, we're going to build on a whole series of books um, from Roger and from this thinking. But I can recommend one already called Rules for Revolutionaries, which is how they built the Bernie Sanders mass campaign in the US. And it's always focusing on who are the people who can get involved? Who are the volunteers? What are they going to do? in really concrete ways. And that's the kind of thing we're building up again here. So we want to fund a small team. Hopefully you're in the donation link right now um, because this is what the team will do, right? We'll create a small team to help empower volunteers, people like you, revolutionaries, rebels across the world to come to these calls and find pathways to action near them, in their country, big ideas that they can act upon and not get lost in despair. That's the pathway. That's what the money is going towards. It's going towards the books that found the formation of the ideas. We're turning Roger's podcast into a book. Um, we're turning the blog posts into a book. And then we're going to go out. We're going to go out and talk to people and turn these into workshops and revolutionary methods to create pathways to action. So that's where the money's going towards. And hopefully you've all had a chance now as I tell my little, do my little speech to, to pop that in.